So I want to welcome everybody into a time now where we're going to study the Word of God. And we are going to be looking at the book of Deuteronomy. So this is a new series for us. There are 34 chapters in the book of Deuteronomy. And we are going to spend 34 weeks studying Deuteronomy, which is the longest series by far that I have ever done. I think the longest one previously was like 17 weeks. So, so we're heading into a good long time in the Word of God. I'm super excited about it, and I hope you are too. You can go ahead and turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 1. If you have a Bible with you, or if you want to pull that up on your phone, it's fine. Uh, fifth book in the Bible, so towards the beginning. While you're doing that, I wanted to, to sort of share this. My wife and I have been going through, we kind of got into this new TV genre of reality TV shows. Um, and they are goofy. Uh, unfortunately, they're also addicting. And every once in a while, they're inspiring. But there's this sort of format that they go through where, you know, whatever the context is, creative context or challenges or whatever they're doing, um, sometimes they're like lifestyle hacks. But there's the opening moments where you get the briefing. You get the challenge. You get the thing that you are called, they're going to be called to do and everybody's going to have to compete over. And then after that, there's the execution. And you get to watch the people create the cake or whatever it is that they are doing. Um, and then there's that competition element in that second half. What I've noticed as I'm watching this is that you never have in that opening briefing an image of somebody sort of just like doing their nails, not paying attention. Right? You never have uh, this picture of this group of people gathered and one person is sort of like struggling to stay awake. Everybody is snapped in and focused on the presenter or on the host. And they are paying attention to hear what that person is saying and what they're being called to. And for good reason. Because how are they going to execute whatever they're being challenged with if they don't pay attention to the briefing? Now, sometimes people still fail, right? And that can be almost as amusing as anything. And they, they fail for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they misunderstand what they were asked to do. Sometimes it's like maybe too challenging, and they're like, this is beyond me, and they feel insecure about it, so they play it sort of safe when they do their, their version of the cake or their version of the painting on the person's face or whatever it is. Sometimes they get creative, and they're like, ooh, I can do this, and I can make this better, and I'm just going to add this component and this component in. And then the judges come at the end, and they say that's a, that's a flop. But they never end up failing because they just weren't paying attention at the beginning. Jesus says in John 5 that you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it's they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Now Jesus is talking to this sort of uptight religious group. And they're really concerned because Jesus is interpreting a part of God's law in a way that's less stringent than what they, how they want it to be interpreted. And so Jesus turns to them and he says, you know, here's the issue. Guys, you're looking at the law as a briefing, as something that God's calling you to, and then you are doing this. But that's not what it actually calls you to. The Bible doesn't call you, the Old Testament doesn't call you to find eternal life through creative law keeping. It calls you to come recognize and follow me. So if you listen to the briefing, and if you pay attention to the Old Testament scriptures, you'll find Jesus. If you don't, you might creatively need to add in something for you to do to feel good about yourself so that you think God loves you. You might misunderstand it. You might think that it's telling you to do this or that. Or you might feel incredibly inadequate as you come to it. And you can't deal with it seriously because it just, it's too high of a standard, so you try to set it aside. But the right way to do it is to go through it and find Jesus, learning to recognize him and follow him. That's what Jesus is getting at here. And the absurd way of approaching this would be not be interested in what it says, right? To check out because it's Deuteronomy. And so, I don't know what your excitement level is when I say we're going to spend 34 weeks going through the book of Deuteronomy. You know, you might be thrilled. You might be like, yes, Deuteronomy. Or you might be like, isn't that law? And isn't that going to end up being like overbearing? Do we really want to do that? Or maybe you're going to be like, 
well, that'll be good because I've been looking for some new ways to kind of improve my religion game. I doubt that that's the way you've said it in your head, but. Now we're gonna go through Deuteronomy and we're gonna take Jesus' sort of lens and we're gonna, we're gonna let that form for us a purpose in being in this book. We're gonna go through Deuteronomy, we're gonna to look to recognize Jesus and then follow him. So today, we're going to be looking at the story in Deuteronomy chapter 1, and we're going to just do one thing. We're going to look for Jesus in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Will you please pray with me? Jesus, we want to follow you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. We want to be your disciples, your followers. We want your words to be the words that give us life. Will you please use this moment, send your spirit to us to take down barriers, to open up our hearts, to make us ready to sit at your feet and listen. And Lord, may your word prove itself powerful to draw us to you. May my words fade away and may yours last. In Jesus' name, amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1. These are the words spoken to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness, in the Arabah, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dizahab. It is 11 days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them. Pause there. I don't know if you uh, mark up your Bibles or not, um, or if you have an app where you can kind of highlight things. But if you do, what I would do is I would highlight or circle 11 days journey in this. Verse 2, that's right there. And then I would highlight or circle 40 days or 40th year. And I'd draw a line between those things. Because my question is, how does an 11-day journey turn into a 40-year caravan? When I was growing up, my family loved to do these road trips. And so we always kind of did a similar type of road trip. We had a place that we liked to go, and it was a three-day journey. If that three-day journey turned into a four-day journey, there would have been a good story to tell. I say good, but it would have been characterized by weeping and wailing on my parents' part, I'm sure. Can you imagine 11 day journey turning into a 40 year caravan? There's a story there. And Deuteronomy 1 is the story. So here's some context. By the time we get here, some of the things that have happened, God has chosen this nation, Israel. And he said, you're my people. He's made a promise with their ancestor that I'm gonna, I'm gonna be your God, you're gonna be my people. And time has gone on, and this group of people has become slaves in the superpower, Egypt, of the day. God shows up, and he rescues them. And he takes them out of Egypt powerfully, miraculously, bringing them to the mountain of God, known as Mount Sinai. Maybe you're familiar with it that way, or as it's called here, Mount Horeb. And on the way there, he had to provide for them miraculously, giving them food and water out of basically nothing, and at the mountain, he gave them a promise and a law. The promise was kind of reinforcing, I'm going to be your God, and I'm going to go with you, and you're going to be my people. No matter where we go, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to lead you to a promised land. The law allowed them to be in the presence of a holy God as a not-so-holy people. And so this is good stuff. And this kind of brings us current in the story where they're at Mount Horeb and Moses is now talking 40 years later to the second generation of Israel. But our story, in Deuteronomy 1 at least, picks up, I'm going to push us forward to verse 19. In verse 19 he says, oh, something got out of order here. Oh, here we go. Then we set out from Horeb, right? That's Mount Sinai, that's the mountain of God. We set out from Horeb and we went through all that great and terrifying wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. 
And I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. I'm staying right here for a second. This doesn't sound like a 40-year journey yet, does it? It's just they've moved without any sort of incident, without any sort of drama, from the mountain of God all the way over to the promised land. Kadesh Barnea is this location just on the outside of the promised land. And they didn't have any issues as they journeyed through the wilderness on the way there. When they get there, God gives them a call, a command. He says, all right, we're ready. It's you guys. It's your generation. You're the ones. Go in and receive what I've given you, this land. But verse 26 happens. Yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. See what happens. They get there, and they come to Moses, and they say, why don't we send some people into the land to kind of check it out? to get us um, some info on where we're going in this land that God is giving us. And the report comes back, and it's awesome, and it's great. It's going to be the perfect land for them. Except for one thing, which we find in verse 27. You murmured in your tents and said, It's because the Lord hated us as he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven, and besides, we've seen the sons of the Anakim there. So they, re they decide they're going to disobey God. They're not going into this place. Why? Because they're afraid of tall people. And that sounds comedic when I say it that way, but it only gets more comedic when you think about where they're, like, what just happened. They were living in Egypt as slaves, the superpower of the ancient world. And God just like decimated them. He took the entire army out with water. And then he brings them through this wilderness where there's no food and they complain about it so God provides food. There's no water so they complain about it and God provides water. They don't know how to live righteously before God so God shows up and shows them how to do that. And then without incident they get to the promised land and they see tall people and they're afraid. It doesn't make a ton of sense. It isn't super logical. But they respond in this moment, right, this way, and they're afraid, and they won't go in there, and then they do this other thing. They accuse God of being hateful, of being faithless. They accuse him of lacking character, of trapping them, and being dishonest. This isn't our problem, God. This is on you. You're the faithless one in this moment. How could you do this to us? Moses tries to reason with them a bit, but they're afraid of dying in the promised land, and nothing is going to change that. And we get to verse 32. In spite of this word that Moses gave them, this reminder of the things that God had done to bring them there, you did not believe the Lord your God who went before you in the way to seek you out a place to pitch your tents. He was with you in fire by night and in cloud by day to show you by which way you should go. But at the end of the day, they would not believe that he was good, that he loved them, that he would show up in the way that he promised he would, that he would continue to lead them the way that they'd experienced, that he could rescue and save them. They would not believe. And so they rebelled. They decided to disobey. And that rebel rebellion, which was filled with accusations against God being the one who was faithless, God being the one who lacked character, God being the one who had lied, led to, it was all really, I guess it was all really born out of this disbelief that, that God isn't what he says he is. And it comes with consequences. There's consequences to treating God this way. They're cursed to wander for 40 years. And the Lord heard your word and was angered. And he swore, not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers. 
that's a rough, this is a rough moment. They're being told, you have a new destiny now. You have a new future now. Up to this point, they've been being told, you're the generation that's entering the promised land. Now they're being told, your whole destiny is to go die in the wilderness so your kids can enter the promised land. That's your future. This is painful and hard. It's hard for them to wrap their heads around. It's severe. It's well described as a curse, this banishment. And it's not even just the, like the people that were directly responsible that get caught up into this. Moses himself, as the faithful leader who within this story is pleading with them, saying, hey, no, go into the land. Uh, God is good. He will be faithful. He'll rescue us. Even Moses gets caught up in this curse. Verse 37, he says, Even with me the Lord was angry on your account and said, You will not go in there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he will enter. So encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. So Moses gets caught up in the curse. Now, he participated in his own way in their act of rebellion. It's not really part of this story. What Moses is painting for us is the story of the first generation of Israel, who proved to be a faithless generation, and who turned an 11-day journey into 40 years of wandering until the last person died in the wilderness. And the second generation is now here ready to enter the promised land to face the same choice that their parents faced. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if I did ask for a show of hands, I bet a lot of hands would go up if I said, how many have heard this story before? This is probably pretty familiar. Um, nothing super groundbreaking or novel, nothing like, what, this happened? Um, maybe that is your story. Maybe you haven't heard this before, and that's totally fine. That's cool. I wish I could be you. But the people listening to this story as Moses gets up and he starts speaking Deuteronomy out there as he starts writing it out, the first people listening in had heard this story over and over and over again. Because think about it, they were that second generation. They were sitting there and they'd heard their parents up late at night grumbling and murmuring and frustrated that they had made such a terrible decision all those years ago. They, they, they'd heard, how many of them had heard their parents on their deathbed with tears in their eyes maybe, but also like this sort of ring of hopefulness saying, don't do what we did. They've heard this story. This is a familiar story. It's intended to be a familiar story. And it would be so easy right now to jump to application, wouldn't it? Don't be like the first generation. Choose to be faithful. If God calls you somewhere, go there. But that wouldn't be listening to what Jesus said at the beginning of our, our morning, would it? Because Jesus said this is a story about him. This is a story about recognizing who Jesus is and then following him. So how do we do that as we look at this? And here's, here's one way we can do it. We can see parallels between Moses, the leader of God's people, and Jesus, the leader of God's people. So take a look at this. First off, the tension of this story is that Moses is called to lead a faithless generation into faithfulness before God. That's his job, and it's a rough one. You could say it's an impossible one. His job is to get this, this people who want to rebel, whose hearts are set on rebellion, and, he's, he, and, and they don't believe God, they, they, they want to accuse God before they follow him, you know, all that stuff. That's true of them. And Moses' job is to no, no, teach them to be holy, teach them to be faithful, like lead them into the promised land and experiences the promises of God. And he can't do it, can he? That's the tension of the story. Faithful Moses dealing with faithless Israel. And that's a Jesus story. I could immediately spiritualize this into like Jesus interacting with all peoples. But I don't even have to. I can just take this moment in Mark chapter 9 where Jesus steps into this and almost like role plays this drama for us. Moses went out Mount Horeb and there he met God practically. His presence was there and Moses was transformed. In Mark 9, Jesus goes up some unnamed mountain, and he meets with God the Father, and he is transformed. And then Moses comes down the mountain, and he meets with the faithless generation of Israel. 
He meets with the people who refuse to listen to God, who refuse to go and do battle with the Amorites, who refuse to take on the Anakim. Right? They're too afraid, and they don't think that God will be able to give them victory. Well, when Jesus comes down his mountain in Mark 9, he meets his disciples, and a crowd gathered, because his disciples can't cast out an enemy of God, a demon. They, they can't do battle with this thing and win. And so they're left on the outside of this moment. And you know how Jesus describes them? A faithless generation. And Mark is encouraging us to see something here. That Jesus is dealing with the same tension in his ministry that Moses dealt with his. Jesus, like Moses, is the leader of a faithless people and he's supposed to be getting them to be faithful. And he ends up with the same difficulty where when he leaves them alone, they can't even fight with the enemies of God. And, and that parallel gets stronger because, again, Moses has seen this, has led this generation through experience after experience after experience of God's faithfulness and power just like Jesus had led his disciples through healing, after exorcism, after authoritative teaching. And even so, he deals with a faithless generation. So Jesus and Moses face the same issue. And both of these become historic snapshots and pictures for us to recognize our own lives and our, our own larger story that God is dealing with the faithless people of the world and he's calling us to faithfulness but we keep doing stuff like rebel, accuse God of being faithless, accuse God of being the problem, why it is that we can't quite live the right way that we know we're supposed to. It's sort of God's fault for putting us in the circumstances that he put us in or not dealing with the problems of evil in the world the right way. So we accuse God and it all stems from this disbelief, regardless of how many experiences we can point back to and say that God has been good. All right, so Moses has a faithless generation. Jesus has all the faithless generations to lead. Second, you see Moses getting wound up in this curse, right? He gets sort of like taken up into it, and, and he has to carry it on himself as well. And so Moses heads off into the wilderness to die there with the first generation. And it doesn't take a lot of imagination to start seeing Jesus in that, does it? In Isaiah 53, describing who Jesus is going to be and what his role is going to be, the, the prophet says, Jesus, I'm going to call him Jesus instead of he, but Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. And then Paul, thinking back to the story of Jesus, describes it like this. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Our rebellion ends up with leading us to the same type of banishment that Israel gets banished with. We're sent away from the presence of God. We're sent away from the blessings of being God's people to die, not just in a wilderness, but just spiritually to die, physically to die, to head off to an eternity of separation with God, separation from God's kingdom and his presence and his goodness. And Jesus takes that on when he goes to the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is separated from the goodness of the Father, from the love of the Father, and he receives instead the wrath of God against our sins. He becomes a curse for us. But here's, the, here's where it start, the stories start to separate. Moses is wound up in Israel's sin and he can't make it through. In fact, in a way, Israel's sin overwhelms him and he starts participating with it on his own. And he gets his own, has his own issues. But that's not Jesus' story. Jesus' story is faithfulness from beginning to end. And so Jesus carries the weight of this curse for us, not with us, for us. He becomes a curse for us. It's for our transgressions. It's for our iniquities. He's the substitute that Moses could never really be. 
And so, so, so this, our sins don't just, you know, we don't just walk with Jesus through our wilderness of death and spiritual separation from God, but Jesus leads us through carrying the brunt of it, carving a path forward where we funnel behind him to be safe. Jesus is greater than Moses. And then we get to the, the last piece here. Across the book of Deuteronomy, there's, a, there's several different themes. But one of them is replacement. And we saw it already. Moses is replaced by Joshua, right? Moses doesn't get to be the person who leads God's people into the promised land. He failed. And so he gets cursed and left outside. And Joshua takes his place. And then Joshua leads God's people for a little while. But eventually he fails. Eventually, Joshua doesn't lead Israel into a full conquest of the promised land like he is called to do. He dies off, and he's replaced by a bunch of different people. We call them the judges. There's this period of time where there's no real king over Israel. There's just these people kind of administering God's judgments. And they all fail, and so they're replaced by kings. And king is replaced by king is replaced by king is replaced by king. All of them trying to do what Moses was called to do, which is lead God's people into faithfulness, into right relationship with God. And they can't do it because they have the same tension and the same struggle and the same issue. It's a faithless people, and it's an impossible task. And so replacement after replacement after replacement is the story of Israel until Jesus. And this is where Jesus just rises above everyone and he just way blows past Moses because he is faithful and he does something that no one has ever done before. He doesn't just like exist with God's people in their faithless state, but he cleanses them at his cross. But then he comes back to life three days later and gives them his resurrection power. And Jesus gives them something that no one has ever had before. The power of God to resurrect hearts and to purify hearts and to cleanse us from, from inside so that the law then as we look at it is not this standard that's impossible to keep but this law, we agree with it in our hearts and we say that's beautiful and good and that leads us to God. We long for that. We want to bear fruit of that in our lives and we now don't have to just be like sad about it but King Jesus has given us his resurrected life and so we can say yes for the first time ever. The faithful king has created a faithful people. Does that mean we still f like sin? Yeah, every, yeah, that happens. But his cross still has power to cleanse. And his resurrection has power to give life. This is brand new. Jesus is in another category. And you know what? Let's not replace him. Because God's not going to. And so you get to the end of the story of the whole Bible. You get to Revelation, the last book. And you see this. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. This is what Moses was shooting for, but he could never make happen. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Jesus does what Moses and no other king, no other leader of God's people could ever do. He gets us to the promised land. And the promised land is not a location somewhere on earth to go, like the Palestine or something like that. The promised land is the presence of God, us being with God forever. And that's coming. We get to taste that today. But it's coming in a way that you and I have never experienced yet. And so what are you supposed to do with this, right? Every good sermon ends with good application where you walk out of here and you can change and do something different. Well, here's what you do with this. You get excited about Jesus as your king because you don't have crotchety Moses who's been wandering for 40 years so fed up with this people for screwing up so bad. He's not your leader. You don't have the young idealistic Joshua being like, guys, let's take the Canaan. No, you've got Jesus who's walked through death ahead of you. He's walked through darkness you've never felt. And he says, I will lead you. I will be your king and your shepherd and your guide and your Lord and your rescuer. 
get excited. He is a good king. And we worship him. But we can actually, you know, like also learn things about how we should respond and follow Jesus from the text. You can't read the story without seeing the choice put in front of Israel's first generation to follow God where he calls them and where he leads or to disbelieve and to make excuses and accuse God of being faithless somehow. And this is so practical. Because you and I face things like midlife crises. Where we hit that moment and we're asking, have I lived right? That question from, our, from Bruce this morning, did I live the life that was meaningful? Oh, maybe I didn't. And the darkness comes in and we look for the excuses to say it's God's fault that I didn't live the way that I was supposed to. And, and I can't, you know, what am I going to do to make my life find meaning and have meaning and how do I build this new second phase on my own? And, and to this moment, God speaks and says, come follow me. Come follow King Jesus, laying down the rest of your life and picking up a cross. Moments like the incredible scariness of death. That wasn't a very well poetized sentence. It's okay. Death is not beautiful. Death is not poetic. Death is scary and it is dark. It is separation. And we will each face this. We will face it encroaching on our lives through illnesses and aging. And it's scary. And Israel faced into the promised land and saw death. That's what, that's what she saw. And it was scary. But the call was to come follow their God and Lord, even through that, to find the promised land, to find the life on the other side. It's the same call that Jesus gives to us. He says, come follow me through death to the eternity on the other side as a child of God, as a loved one of God. And you can insert the, the dilemma or the hard thing that you're being called to right now, the place where the Spirit has said, come bear fruits of righteousness, and you're like, yeah, but I don't want to. Because it's going to hurt, or it's going to be painful, it's going to require some sort of sacrifice. And Jesus says, yeah, but come, follow me, and find the promised land, either on the other side of that moment today, or find the value of that in eternity, as you look back at the life you've lived. This is the call to follow Jesus that we find when we read Deuteronomy 1. To find life not in Deuteronomy 1, but to find life in Deuteronomy 1 pointing us to Jesus the Lamb who was slain and resurrected as our King and our Lord. Will you pray with me?